Welcome to Conversations for Course Creators. I am Lucas Marino and I'm your host, and I am super excited to bring you episode four in this podcast. Now, tonight is a little different. Up until now, I've been doing purely audio podcast uh, publication, and tonight I'm mixing up it a little bit and I'm bringing you video content as well. So this will be posted on YouTube. It'll also be present on my website. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's related to the topic of tonight's show. And that is the use of video for multiple reasons in course development and course marketing. So let's start with the marketing piece to kind of continue the theme of the last two episodes. For those that haven't listened to episode two and three of the podcast yet, I encourage you to go check them out. And basically what I did in the in, in episode two was I covered marketing your courses via social media, kind of a mid to high level conversation. And in episode three, I discussed using webinars and virtual summits as means of generating uh, interest and, and, and capturing leads and actively marketing your courses and programs. So we've done a lot of kind of on the marketing side, right? We've been doing a lot of discussion about different avenues for marketing your courses and getting people to know that you even have a course, because if people don't know it exists, how can you expect them to take part in it? Right? So that impacts your confidence as a, as a course developer and deliverer. Uh, if no one's signing up for your courses, you start to wonder if you design something that's actually of interest to people. And of course, sales is, uh, is tied to revenue. And, and so if you're a business, you have to have revenue to survive. So of course, those last two episodes cover some pretty, pretty important topics. But tonight, this is the fun stuff because we're going to talk about video in, the, in, the, in relation to your marketing, but also video in relation to your curriculum. So let's talk about the marketing piece first. Now, with marketing, outside of webinars and outside of summits, you can use live streaming. Okay, so that's one way we can use video to approach marketing our courses, mix things up a little bit with our social media campaigns. You can even embed live stream videos in your website. So I'm using Restream to record this episode and Restream has the ability for you to embed code in your website so that your live stream plays directly on your site, which is super cool, right? Because you could invite people to that page. You could set up and embed that code in that page. And then when it's showtime, you're on and people could be uh, connected to that to that page, that landing page or your homepage or wherever you've got it. I've got mine on a free resources page with my blogs and my, my uh, podcasts, but you could, you could literally create a landing page just for your live streams and then share that link with people in your news letters and people in your emails, people in your social media channels, if you wanted to drive traffic to your site. So that's one of the ways you can do that is you can leverage social media and these other means. I just, I just, described to get the word out about live streaming to your website and drive some traffic to your site. Another way to do it is to do the live streaming on the social media. And little little trick here, you can do it to all of those places at once if you have a tool like Restream. So I, one of the benefits I think to having a real true streaming platform like Restream or StreamYard or one of the other popular types of streaming software that are out there is and particularly with uh, my experience with Restream, I'm able to select all of my social media accounts and my web page and broadcast once live to all of those locations simultaneously. Yes. So this is super cool if you're like me and you've got a certain group of people you're trying to reach on Facebook and another group of people you're trying to reach on LinkedIn and another group of people that follow your YouTube channel and another group of people that are maybe not into social media and would rather just go to your web page and they've either have access through like a paid membership or subscription to your site or just general free content on your web page. You can use streaming software to reach all of those people. So it's a very powerful thing. Now, 
it is live and you have to be comfortable with setting up the, the feed and being on live broadcast. So part of the way I got around that when I first started live streaming with East Partnership is I stood up a show called Life Cycles Live and we did about 50 videos. I think it was close to 50 videos. We set up a schedule where I would I would live stream every Wednesday afternoon right around four o'clock Eastern time and I would bring a guest on and it was an unscripted conversation between me and a, and a guest and that guest was someone that was very usually very familiar with a core group of my of my population, my audience. And so they were interested in seeing us get together and and have a discussion that was, uh, maybe centered around a topic, but definitely not scripted. And it was always fun. And the cool thing about using a platform like Restream is we were able to interact with people in real time in the chat. And I could determine whether I wanted those chats to pop up on the screen or not. And we were going back and forth with the audience while we were having this great conversation. So it was a really cool way to interact with my audience, but in a selective way where I could screen what we were going to talk about, what comments we would address, which ones I wanted to put on the screen to make them really feel like they're part of the show. It's an entertainment factor, and we just had a really good time with it. So big thumbs ups. My point there is I used a kind of a relaxed format where we weren't under this strict scripting. I brought in people I'm already comfortable with just hanging out, talking with. We talked about topics that we were very familiar with. And I used the software that I was using for other things, which made me comfortable with the tool set. So all of that brings down the stress. Now you can get software like Restream or StreamYard or like I said, one of these other software packages that can help you out with this. They're, they're almost all web browser based. And you can experiment with them. Right now I'm using Restream in a recording only function, which means I'm not live streaming this, but I'm using the same tool. It's the same player. It's the same options with, uh, or they're, they are, uh, we have the same options for like branding settings, logos, overlays, video clips, everything. It's all the same as when I'm doing it live. So I could get on here in the studio in record only mode, and I could just hit record and I could experiment and get myself comfortable with the software, erase the videos, and then be ready when it's time to live stream at your scheduled event. Now, when should you when should you advertise those live streams? I'm a big fan of doing it within a week of the event, unless it's a really big event and you're gonna draw a lot of people or you're trying to draw a lot of people and you know this is gonna be structured. It's not just gonna be a, a, a quick conversation with somebody, probably less, you know, more than an hour very formatted. If, if you're in that kind of situation where you're, you're literally hosting like an event, like a panel and all that, and you're trying to generate some interest, I would say go out to two weeks. Now, why not be on two weeks? Well, people have very short memories when it comes to things like this and they're not paying and they're going to fit it into their busy day and it's going to be on their social media. So when you put all those things together, you realize this just isn't going to be like selling tickets to a live event where you're going to have a panel in a conference somewhere. It's, it's different, right? Uh, the cool thing is, though, is that it is that it's different, that it's not those things. So you can broadcast on a Wednesday and start advertising it during the weekend prior to the event. And you'll get a good group of people if you have a healthy a number of followers on your social media. And it's relevant, it's timely, it's within a week so they can figure out whether it really fits their schedule or not. And they're not just saying, yeah, sure, and then I'll worry about it in three weeks when the time comes. So my, my general goal is about a week out. Uh, and, and if I wanna stretch it more, I'll go two weeks. You can, you can use these types of mediums, like live streaming, to market your courses around the topics in your courses or just in general on the topics of your expertise. And you can do it in a very structured way. So I do this with authors. A friend of mine had a book um, and or has a book and he published it. And we did a live stream chapter of his book every month. We did one episode 
uh, just for his book. We covered a chapter of his book in that episode and people loved it. They tuned in every month and it's been very popular on my YouTube channel. So I get a lot of traffic to the channel just to check out episodes one through five of that series. And now I can categorize them in a playlist on my YouTube channel. And when people go to my YouTube channel, they can see that particular category or playlist of, of videos and they can, they can, they can fanboy it up and watch all of them in one shot or whatever. Right. <laughs> so I find the flexibility and, uh, an ability to kind of package your message, uh, very appealing, right? So you can do the streams, you can push the stuff out to YouTube. You can put it in your playlist. You can have that documented. People can visit your site. They can see these videos in series instead of just one big pile of videos. So very cool. Now, the other piece about uh, live streaming is you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, not even guests, but just other people that are attending the event via the chat or, or whatever the case may be, related to the topic in your course down to a certain level, right? So you definitely want to tell them what you're talking about, like what the topic of the book or the chapter of your course or the lesson in your course or whatever, whatever that, that topic is, you can dive into what it is in a live stream and really generate interest. And then essentially you can use that, uh, without telling all of the why, right? Like instead of like all the nuts and bolts of how this stuff works, uh, you can save that for the course. So it's a really good way to have a show, be interactive. It's not a webinar, but it's similar and you have a lot of control. It's a pretty cool, pretty cool way to do this. So that's the kind of the marketing piece, the live stream piece. Now you can record videos just like I'm doing here and then upload those to your YouTube or to your social media channels as a recording. And that's perfectly fine as well. The thing you're missing there is that interactive real time on, on live feed discussion and interaction with your audience, but you can still broadcast a video and be in the chat to talk to people. So you can tell people like, Hey, we're going to, I'm going to show this latest episode and I'll be live answering your questions and talking to you in the chat. So join me at X time. And, and there's, there's people that like, uh, like that format as well. So my preference is the live, uh, the live stream with the interaction live. Cause that's, that's pretty cool. And, and it, it really gets people to come out of their shell and interact with you because whether they say it or not out loud, they like being on the live feed with you. They've been watching TV their whole lives and they've never been able to just reach through the TV and interact directly with the people on the screen. And they can do that in the live stream and they will do that. So if you're live streaming and you have an appreciable group of people and you already have some relationships established, be ready for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, for that reason, I always keep my chat hidden and I selectively drag things in because you never know what someone, anyone can get on there and make a comment. Okay. So moving past the live streaming on my social media and moving more toward the inclusion of video in my course curriculum, I am almost, almost always defaulting to a video lesson as the primary lesson type in my courses. So if I'm outlining a course, almost every one of those lessons in each of the chapters in the curriculum is going to be a video file. Now, of course, that's not going to stay that way. I'm going to add quizzes and surveys and, and, uh, and text files and downloads via PDF and all other different types, exams, I mean, different types of, of lessons, but the predominant lesson type is going to be video. There's several reasons I do this. Same reasons that are going to be very obvious to, to you, I hope. And is that people like to see you. Like it's that simple. I, I'm buying your course. I'm spending good money. I might be really good with learning via just audio, but there are a significant number of people that have to see that mouth moving while they're hearing those words to really grasp it. 
And it's also a way for them to get to know you better. So when you put video of yourself in your course, you are infusing more of your personality and your presence in the product you're giving them. And to me, that's a super cool thing that we take for granted. So there are musicians who have made their entire career on live shows because they're just so good live. They do great with record sales, but that's not what pays the bills. The live shows pay the bills, right? Because you can go get that ticket and see that musician live and they're just phenomenal. The, the album doesn't do them justice, right? I view that kind of the same way with courses. When I can see the instructor and not just hear the instructor, it just takes it to another level. And when they're good, I'm engaged. And I'll use one of my mentors, Honoré Corder, as a good example of this. I've taken several of Honoré's courses, and I always enjoy when she does video in her courses because she's a very engaging person, and her personality is just fantastic. And it really comes through when you can see Honoré, and you can it, you you've got that that level of of experience with the course material. That's beyond just hearing her voice and reading text. Now, video is not ideal for every application. If I get on here and I just start spitting out tons of very detailed information, like bunches of numbers or lots of very detailed bullets that I'm like, hey, make sure you remember this. And I'm just talking and they're very fine, detailed points and they're all very critical and different from each other then that is going to put your learner at a disadvantage because it's hard for them to just capture all that immediately with just their ears. They need to see that as well. This is where I like presentation mode. Call it PowerPoint or use Canva or whatever you want, but a professional presentation with those data points or information captured on the screen with your, with either a, 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 a segment of the screen dedicated to video and obviously an audio uh, layer as well. And so I'm hearing the information, I'm digesting it with my eyes, I'm not necessarily distracted by an instructor. This is kind of the bread and butter for when I started East Partnership. We, I was teaching very technical things that required a lot of concentration and intentionally did not integrate video into those lessons so that my learners could focus on the material on the slide and listen. I wanted them to hear it and I wanted them to see it, but I wasn't the thing they needed to see at that point. So when you work with people that are like, everything's one way or the other, black or white, and they can't see any gray, they don't realize that a really good course incorporates all of these things, right? So you can do a very interactive video or engaging, I shouldn't say interactive, a very engaging video as a part of your course and immediately follow it with that detailed presentation I was talking about. And you break those things up into bite-sized chunks so that they get a change of pace, right? So you see a video like this where I'm engaging you and I'm giving you a lot to, to hear and see at the same time without putting a ton of very detailed data on you. I'm prepping you for the presentation. And then off we go into the presentation. The screen shifts, it goes to presentation. And now they're they're seeing all the things they just heard me describe at a high level. And they're in the weeds learning and they're hearing my voice, teaching them the material in the presentation. And they're absorbing that. And they get that for a certain amount of time and then it, it stops. And we go back to another medium like video. And so what we're doing is we're changing, we're, we might be keeping a drum beat or a rhythm to the curriculum, but we're changing what they see and hear to keep their brain engaged in the course. Because there's nothing worse than an hour of just hearing someone monotonously drone on and on about this and that and blah, 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 blah. And there's a slide and it's stuck up there for 15 minutes and then it changes and it sits there for another 15 minutes and then it changes these people are not learning well. I'm guaranteeing it. They're going to have to go back and do it again. They are not learning well. Now, I do not like to speak in absolutes, but I am going to tell you that the 
the majority of people attending your courses would prefer not to learn that way because it makes it hard for them to stay engaged. So if you have presentation content on slides, I recommend you only put enough information on that slide to talk for no more than 10 minutes at all. And I aim for five, right? I want to, I want to slide change every two to five minutes is kind of my rule of thumb. Two to five minutes. Now, if this is very detailed stuff and there's a lot on the slide and we have to go through, 10. But you've got to avoid going over that. People will not stay engaged with one picture and that much information for that long. Remember, it's not video. It's presentation, right? So they need that change. They need the change of, of, of screen to keep their brain where you want it. So, okay. So that's, uh, that's my point about changing the pace, using video to create a rhythm and change pace and change scenery in your courses, injecting your personality into your courses. Remember video must have decent quality. You can, you can get away with some issues with video. You can't get away with issues with audio, right? You have to have good audio. That's just, that's just a must with, with video. It's a little bit more forgiving. You don't have to have some elaborate background. You don't have to be wearing a suit, right? You have to be, uh, you have to have an appropriate, uh, visual presentation for the setting, right? So like, this is a rather relaxed podcast. So it's okay for me to get on here in blue t-shirt, right? This would not be good if I was recording this to present to a very professional training platform, right? So if I was training my engineers, I wouldn't be wearing this, right? I would be dressed like as if I were standing in front of them teaching them. And they would see that in the video and they would associate that with the quality of the course. And the video would, uh, the quality of the video, that would be a part of it. So with the background, right? So with the audio, all of these things add up. So if you're going to do video, make sure you have a decent camera. I prefer a 1080 or, or, or a 1080 uh, with HD functionality, <clears throat> high definition. Okay, 720 is decent, but don't go lower than 720. You're going to be pushed to 480 by some platforms. That's fine. Let them push you to whatever they do but you record it in higher definition. If you can record it in high definition, 1080. And this should be showing as a 1080 high def uh, recording. Now, Restream allows me to do that. It is intensive on the software. Zoom gives you the ability to capture some pretty good visual uh, quality, uh, video quality, sorry. And there's a, there's a host of other platforms. I'm not going to go through all of them, but Make sure that whichever video recording platform you use, that it can support the appropriate level of video quality to meet the needs of your audience. Remember, all of this is about them, not you, right? So this video is not about me. This is not about me. It's about you. And I know who's going to watch this generally. And I know what they're going to want to see. And this is going to be okay. So... If I knew that this wasn't going to be okay, I would have not recorded it this way. I might record it in a different setting. The intros to my courses are almost always, always recorded in front of a, in front of a blank background where I can engage that learner for roughly 45 seconds to two minutes as I do a quick welcome video and there's no distractions. It's me with a high def camera, sometimes in like a portrait video mode, talking straight into the camera, keeping it short and to the point, good pace in my, in my, in my diction, right? With my speaking. And then right out of that video into something new, want to get the point across and move forward and not have distractions in my, in my view uh, on the screen. Like this behind me, as much as I love that, right? And it's like all the nice things that people send me, that wouldn't be in the intro to my course because that's not the appropriate thing to have as the intro to my course. So, all right, you get the point. I will uh, start to wrap this episode because I try to keep these two under 25 minutes.
uh, I would encourage you to play. That's my big kind of, I want, I want to leave you with the confidence of experimentation. Most of the time when we get into these conversations with clients, they start to get a little overwhelmed with it. They're like, man, there's all these elements to think about. I went into this knowing that I needed to learn some stuff, but now I'm just like, oh my gosh, I got to like worry about every little thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, you know, what about my camera? Is my camera good enough? Is, is the lighting right? You know, I mean, like, you, you know, experiment. So I've got two regular lamps in here. I don't even have a ring light running right now, but when I recorded my intro to one of my courses this morning, I had a ring light standing in front of a wall with nothing on it behind me and a pretty tight frame and a very short video with a straight shot of information and off we go. So you don't have to make this complex. Matter of fact, I recorded that video on my phone because my HD camera on my phone is phenomenal. So my S21 cameras are just fantastic for getting HD video almost to the point where I'm like, sometimes I'm like, man, I didn't need to shoot that again because you can see every vein in my eye. <laughs> I can tell I haven't been sleeping. So <laughs> I'm like, well, maybe I should just you know kick this one out a little bit and, and shoot it again tomorrow when, when I've actually had some sleep. So uh, yeah, my, my big, my big parting point is be confident that you can experiment. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time. You can always re-record. You should experiment. You should have fun with it. You should try different things. Don't be afraid to invest in some equipment. My Logitech Brio that I'm recording the video on for this uh, session is fantastic. And I spent less than $150 on it. That Logitech vi uh, Brio is one of the best purchases I made this year. My whole audio setup was, I don't know, with the interface and everything, less than $300. So between these two, and my, yeah, I've got I've got less than $500 invested in all the audio and vi video capability I need. And that's not a lot of money. And you can get lapel mics, they're called lavaliers. You can get those for anywhere from $50 to $150. This stuff isn't crazy. Uh, you don't need a $6,000 camera and a $2,000 audio configuration. You can, you can do a really good job and experiment and have fun and be willing to try different settings, different places, and, and have fun with it because, honestly, it's one of the more fun parts of course development. So, Okay, so that's it for tonight's episode. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got one episode coming out every day this week as kind of like the big kickoff. And on Friday, May 20th, I believe it's 2 o'clock Eastern time, I'm going to have a guest on. It'll be my first guest, and my, my friend Robert Anderson's coming on to talk to us. He just just went through the process of assembling and and building a virtual summit and that's pretty cool and i'd like for him to talk a little bit about that experience but the big thing with with robert is he's an author who has this fantastic approach to his summit it's called the fearless lives and he or fear life fearless life summit he wants people to live a fearless life based off of their own experiences and the experiences of others. So he's invited some phenomenal speakers to this event. And in the process of being one of his speakers, I realized what kind of people he's got on this, on this program. And I thought, wow, these people have amazing life stories. Some of them have been to hell and back and it's just very inspiring. It's very educational and Robert's at the center of it. So I'm going to ask him a ton of questions about what he's learned and what are some some of the, the the great people he's he's encountered in this process. And how does he feel about sharing his expertise in a different medium? Because he is an author first, and now he's he's doing this virtual summit. And it would be great for you to hear his experience. And of course, I'm I'm doing summits as well, and and we have a lot of the same people in our network. So. It's, it's, a, it's great to learn from someone that you can relate to and trust and know, and you're really going to like Robert. So tune in on Friday, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode. Have a good one.